please help spread the message of frequency specific microcurrent by clicking on the like button. You can subscribe to us on YouTube or any podcast app. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. You can find the podcast transcription at frequencyspecific.com, as well as more information about frequency specific microcurrent. Hello, everybody. Oh, I'm getting so proud of myself for starting these podcasts all by myself without Kevin's help. I'm going to wait for a few more seconds for everybody to join us live because we have a very special episode today. We have a good friend of mine joining us on the podcast. I feel like everybody that I get to interview, I always introduce them as my good friend because going to the advanced um, meetings that we have every year in Arizona, we have the opportunity to collaborate and meet with so many amazing clinicians and the wonderment of FSM brings us together in one room and the relationships that you form with other FSM practitioners are unlike anything else that I've ever experienced in the last 24 years of practicing. So I'm going to introduce that person while we're waiting for them to join us. It's going to be Dr. David Musnick. I'm super excited that he's going to be joining us. We're going to be talking about brain problems, brain structures, conditions regarding the brain. We have a whole bunch to unpack in the next hour or so. Yeah, so right off the hop, if anybody does have any questions for Dr. Musnick, you can go ahead and start throwing them in the chat. Is Dr. Musnick taking new patients currently? I'll let Dr. Musnick answer that. I believe he is. He is practicing in Idaho right now. So for those of you who are lucky enough to be in Idaho and can go see Dr. Musnick live, that would be a, an amazing thing for you to be one of his patients, that's for sure. So we have a couple questions coming in. Why don't I jump in and answer some of the ones while we're waiting for Dr. Musnick to rejoin us here? One of the questions that came in, why would the sleep protocol actually cause alertness with a patient? That's a great um, question. I would have to relook at the sleep protocol for me to answer that off the cuff, Denise, because yeah, and then he, she had written, the person does not have ADHD. So there's always an exception to every rule, right? Sometimes we have people like with with Benadryl, for instance, it should be sleepy and some kids get really hyper when they take it. So I would have to see, I would have to break down. Oh, there's Dr. Musnick. There he is. One second. I'm going to promote him to panelist and we should be off to the races here. I think we're good to go now. Dr. Musnick is joining us live. This is the fun part of recording a live show. So we're going to ask Dr. Musnick to start his camera and to unmute himself, and then he'll be with us. There you are. You're here. We're all set. So very first, before we start, everybody, please welcome Dr. David Musnick to our show. Like I said, we're going to be talking about brain health, brain injury. We're going to try to keep it streamlined to that today, if we could, folks. And before we go any further, we all have to wish Dr. David Musnick a very happy birthday. I promise no, I wouldn't say anything. Jim, we're keeping that private, We're keeping Birthdays are a big thing in my house oh, and so on. you're my guest okay, today. Okay, We're all sending fine. you a happy birthday love. Okay. I'm going to have you introduce yourself actually, if, if you could please introduce yourself, where you're working, what your background is and how you found FSM. Okay. So I'm a medical doctor and I am board certified in two, two fields and really three fields. I'm board certified in internal medicine I immediately went into sports medicine. So I'm board certified in sports medicine. So, so, and then certified in functional medicine. And so I've got 28 years of experience in functional medicine. I'm very well trained in functional immunology, which is autoimmune diseases and viral illnesses and all kinds of things regarding the immune system. And then I'm trained in homeopathy in the French School of Homeopathy. I got into FSM in 2009 after a number of experiences where I was going to give a talk to 500 doctors at a functional medicine meeting. And I woke up at the hotel in Baltimore. The first one, I couldn't move my neck. I had a facet syndrome, probably. I couldn't move my neck. And so that I, I walked past where Carol was. And I knew who she was, but I didn't. And then she said, hey, Dr. M, aren't you giving a talk today? I go, yeah, I'm going to the lecture hall. She goes, how are you? And I turned my whole body like this. I said, I'm fine. How are you? And she goes, you're not fine. You didn't even move your neck. So then I told her what happened. And then she treated me 
And then I got up, I had full range of motion in my neck. And to this day, I can't even believe it because I couldn't move my neck. The same thing happened a year later. So then in 2008, the same thing happened with my low back, with my low back. And then after that, I said, okay, this worked twice. I better learn this. And most doctors don't go to 40 hour seminars, meetings, and then you know, they might buy equipment. In those days, the equipment was very expensive to get started. I, I put $20,000 into a, a blue box and four custom pairs. So anyway, that's how I got into it. But I ramped up very quickly. I was immediately asked to start speaking at the advanced meetings. And what I did, which I think was, I was one of the first to do this, was I integrated functional medicine with FSM in my talks. So would pick different topics like insomnia, brain health, energy, all, joint health, all kinds of things and give a talk like that. And my practice is in Eagle, Idaho. It's a place called FMI Center for Optimal Health. I was in Seattle until two years ago, but we have a, a really amazing clinic in Eagle, Idaho. And I do everything from FSM, and but I also do regenerative PRP, bone marrow aspirate, ultrasound guided injections, prolotherapy. I'm doing prolotherapy to stabilize hypermobile joints for a long time, 26 years. I remember when Carol and I first, so Carol and I have had some interesting conversations over the years because yeah. I, I think prolotherapy is still indicated. I don't think FSM can build tissue. It doesn't. Right. Right. So I think there's good integrations with some of these regenerative injections and FSM. And, and what I've yeah, done- FSM has a wonderful space to be used after injections like we see right. in traditional sports. So definitely right. can help. So I want to steer the ship a little bit. That's my job as the FSM podcast co-host is I just drive the bus for everybody. So I want to steer us into talking a little bit about concussion, traumatic brain injury, and maybe if you could, because we have a lot of lay people that are listening, I think people interchangeably use those words, concussion and traumatic brain injury. Could you please break down the differences between the two for us? Yeah, so um, a traumatic brain injury is actually really when we have residual brain injury and residual problems with brain regions, whereas a concussion is more just hitting the head and having post-concussion syndrome, which may be neck pain, headaches, eye symptoms, dizziness, insomnia, different things, nausea, that's post-concussion syndrome. But if there's persistent dysfunction in brain regions, like memory, focus of attention, finding words, speaking words, cerebellar dysfunction, all kinds of things. That, that, that's brain region dysfunction. That's traumatic brain injury. And traumatic brain injury can vary from mild, moderate to severe. The severe ones have bleeds in their brain and they need surgeries, but most of us are dealing with mild. And diagnosing these, what is, I know the, like the, the concussion assessments that we see in sports have been a bit of a joke throughout the past few years. Where and where are we at right now with diagnosing and assessing concussions? There's a whole bunch of questionnaires that are being used. And so uh, I think one of the problems is I don't think most clinicians are screening well for them and because uh, I don't think you need to click off every box to say someone had a concussion. If, mm -hmm. if someone had their head, if they hit their head and they saw stars and they've got a headache, they have a concussion. Now, if they just have a bone bruise, if they just have a bone bruise to the skull, that's different than it's just something hit them. They don't because a concussion is a brain involves a brain. It's not just the skull. One time I bonked my head. And I was going to, I think I was going to have a big egg on my head from swelling. I, I, I used homeopathy, so it took a lot of arnica. I didn't have an egg there, but I didn't have a concussion. And, and I'll use some examples like that. It's not like I want to use examples just about myself because I've seen about 500 concussion patients or more. But I, I, I don't think it's that difficult to diagnose a concussion. What I think is interesting is a lot of people have had concussions throughout their life. Like one time I slipped on the ice when I was working in Colorado and just my whole occiput smashed on the ice. And so the, the, the other telltale symptom of concussion is being very sleepy for a day or more. That is not normal to be like that sleepy. So I don't think diagnosis is that uh, to tell you the truth, I don't think diagnosis is that interesting. I think the treatment part um, is really interesting because it's not, they're not being treated well in most places. And so that's where I really want to talk a lot about that. And I also want to talk to you a little bit about the crossover between cognitive impairment 
and concussion. Okay, I will it's let very you. Very interesting. Okay, where would you like to start? <laughs> the crossover or the treatment? The crossover. I would like to start on what's the average treatment. So someone has this, they go, they, they, they you got to rule out a brain bleed if someone's having any progressive severe sleepiness. So they get that ruled out. And then, then they, they often go to the primary care doctor or the neurologist. The neurologists don't actually have a treatment plan for concussion. They will diagnose it. They'll have the right code, but they don't work off what's called the pathophysiology. So the, one of the key things, the pathophysiology is what's actually going on in the brain. What are the pathways going on that we need to address? And one of the things I like about FSM is that it's based on a lot of pathophysiology, pathological anatomy and pathological uh, function. And so if you look at all the research on head injuries, it's absolutely fascinating. They've done a lot of research where they give rats head injuries, mice head injuries. They don't give people head injuries, but they do a lot of research on people, but they can't stick needles in there, get their CSF or whatever. Um, so the pathophysiology of head injury is fascinating. And what's also fascinating, there's a very significant crossover, like Venn diagram, of the pathophysiology of cognitive impairment. Because I'm seeing like an epidemic of cognitive impairment in anybody from adults uh, it, from in their 30s. I've seen it in their 30s. And where saw, would, what would that be attributed to? Somebody well, said, I saw a gal that came into my, I used to work in Washington. She was 34. She said, Dr. M, I heard you're a brain specialist. You developed a, a, a plan to heal concussion. I don't think I have a concussion, but I think I'm getting demented. This was a 34-year-old gal. And so one of the things that's totally fascinating about this is when that's going on in the 30s and 40s, you really have to look at severe brain insults, severe. Um and so there's certain things I look for, but the first thing I look for is electromagnetic fields. And I asked her, when did this start? And she said, two years ago. So this has been going on for two years. She was a mother of three, but a pretty high level executive in a company. She needed her brain to function. So what was fascinating was I took a basic electromagnetic field history in front. She was there. I said, okay, I want to know these things. And so I've got a really good EMF history that I take. And one of the first things I say is, do you have a bed that you plug in the wall? She goes, I don't know. Maybe I do. I don't know. Then I said, okay, do you have any things that you talk to and they do things like, and she goes, you mean Alexis? I go, yeah, Alexis. Then I go, how many do you have? She goes, we have one in every room. I said, you're kidding. And she said, we have one in the, do you have one in the master bedroom in your room? She goes, yeah, we have two there. We just really wanted to work on it again. You've got to be kidding. And then she said, the only person in the family that is not having brain problems is my four-year-old daughter. And she said, she does not want Alexa in her bedroom because she thinks Alexa is a bad person. So <laughs> I said, okay, what we're going to do- Maybe right. It, it, Alexa was a bad person. It was a bad device. But anyways, I do this thing now when anybody's having brain problems, I send an electromagnetic field technician to the home to do measurements. And this gal called me on the phone in between a patient like what occurred two weeks later. And she goes, Dr. M, you won't believe this. I just measured this woman's bed. It is as, as if she's sleeping under a massive power line every night. And then she said she measured the Alexis. And even when you're not talking to the Alexis, the Alexis is putting out massive radio frequency fields. So they took all the Alexis out, unplugged this woman's bed. And then I started my Heal the Brain program. And she did really well, but I, I'll tell you what, I think if, if she hadn't found me, we haven't done that, she would have been like literally demented because that's what was happening. She couldn't find words. Her memory wasn't working. Now, that wasn't a traumatic head injury. That was brain damage. Right. But I, I become fascinated with this because I'm seeing people as early as the 30s, a lot of people in their 50s with what appears to be cognitive impairment. And what's been really useful is understanding these pathophysiology pathways that I'll explain a few of them. Okay. I don't want to, I mean, at the advanced meeting, I'm going to go over all of them Okay. because even though I've done this a number of years ago, we're going to update it because it's gotten even more fascinating. When you, what's really fascinating is the, the, a lot of the research on head injury has revealed the pathophysiology of how the brain gets damaged in different parts of it. Okay. So one of the things you have is you have damage to the blood brain barrier and 
Damage to the blood brain barrier is interesting because that can let in viruses and immune cells that really shouldn't be getting in there and parts of bacteria called LPS. And that can cause gross inflammatory reactions in the brain. So damage to the blood brain barrier um, is fascinating. And when I show this stuff at the advanced meeting, I, I have wonderful slides of the blood brain barrier. I don't have bumper stickers and I have a relatively I say relatively new car, a Nissan Pathfinder. I used to have a 10-year-old Subaru Outback. On the Subaru Outback, I probably would put a bumper sticker, but I didn't. I would say, what would, how do you have people remember stuff? You go, if I had a bumper sticker, I'd say, take care of your blood-brain barrier. That would be one of them that nobody would ever have. So I'd have to get that custom made. If everybody took care of their blood-brain barrier and made sure they didn't have antibodies to the blood-brain barrier, they'd have better brain health because that's probably how a lot of cognitive impairment sets up that people have antibodies to their blood-brain barrier, either from a head injury or other reasons. And how is that diagnosed? How does one go? There's a blood test. There's a blood test where the there's a number of labs that are doing this, Vibrant Labs and Cyrex Labs. There's a number of labs, ARUP Labs, that are testing SB100 antigen and SB100 antibodies. But there's even antibodies to the microglial cells. There's antibodies to about five different structures in the blood-brain barrier. And so that actually can be tested. So other pathophysiology, if you're interested, is the microglial cells are supposed to be immune cells in there, and they can be producing trophic factors, which means they produce nerve growth factor, they produce um, BDNF, which a lot of people have heard about, which is brain-derived nerve growth factor, and BDNF is so important. I talk to my patients about this, say, look, this is like the fertilizer. If you're going to plant a rose, roses, let's say, if you're going to plant blueberries to take that, then you better acidify the soil, and you better put fertilizer. That's what BADNF does both of those things. It creates the exact environment to branch off synaptic connections called synaptogenesis off the neurons because you can have fewer neurons because you have, let's say, because the brain shrunk with age or someone's had damage and they lost neurons. But if you have more connections between the neurons you have, you may be able to compensate for it, if that makes sense. Yep. So we need the microglial cells to produce the trophic factors. And the microglial cells also produce anti-inflammatory things. Like if they're behaving themselves, that's great. But oftentimes it's the microglial cells gone bad. I don't know a funnier way to say that, but if microglial cells go bad, all havoc gets wrecked, goes on in the brain, and then you have brain inflammation. So one of the key reasons for brain inflammation besides lipopolysaccharide getting in there is the microglial cells staying in what's called a, a morphology of M1. Okay. And if they're in the M2 morphology, they're producing the right things. So that leads into the pathophysiology of brain inflammation. Okay. The brain inflammation is related to migraines. It's definitely related to MS. I started treating a lot of MS patients and you, you combine my Heal a Brain program with FSM because they have these enhanced lesions where they have a lot of brain inflammation and spinal cord inflammation. So I'm very excited. Sometime I'll give like either a case study or a whole presentation on how to approach MS with the integration of immunology and functional medicine and FSM. So there's a lot of conditions that have brain inflammation. And that's only three of probably the 12 or more pathophysiological pathways because one of them that's utterly fascinating is folding proteins. If you have a head injury or you have other things going on with DNA damage and you can't fold the proteins properly in your cells, then you're going to get misfolded proteins that causes havoc in the brain. So that's can you, actually- can you break that down? Just like I said, we have a lot of lay people that listen to this podcast. So folding proteins, can you explain? Misfolded you proteins. Okay. Yeah. So okay. we need, okay. So <laughs> your cells- need to fold the proteins and they need to be in the exact shape. Right. Like enzymes need to create proteins in the correct shape. If they are not in the correct shape, they will not function. So one of the reasons for diseases that a lot of people don't even know about and most doctors do not know about this. So if you want to upset a doctor, go into a doctor's office and say, hey, do you have a treatment for misfolded proteins? And they'll look at you like you're crazy. What is that? But it's pathophysiology. And it's yeah. related to a lot of diseases. 
even probably cancer, but a lot of disease, especially neurological and brain issues. And so with brain damage, we start getting misfolded proteins, but even as uh, we age more rapidly, if we're not like tuning up this whole thing about everybody's misfolding proteins. Right. And our body can clean this up to a certain extent, but we have to have the right balance in that. I don't know if that puts that together. No, it does. It, it clarifies a little bit for people. Like I said, we have, we're putting together like a four hour talk in like a one hour podcast here. So I right. want to just try to keep things moving. So we, we talk about inflammation and we treat inflammation a ton with FSM. If we are going to talk about frequencies really quickly with your brain health program, are there certain frequencies on that A channel that you tend to gravitate towards aside from 40, which is inflammation? Yes. Okay. But 40 is the best. It is. It is. But you always want to have 294. Don't forget 294. I oh. have a love affair with 294. And don't forget 94. So if it's brain tissue, it's going to be 94. If it's other tissue, it's probably going to be 294. But 94, although I'll tell you what, I have learned to be very respectful of 94, 94. And often with a new patient, I won't even run it. Yeah. I seem to have so many people getting dizzy and feeling weird with that. And so that's off limits in my practice right now. On the first visit, I'm just like, stay away from that. But uh, 94 on the A channel, um, I do nine because yeah. there's immune things. There's allergic things. There's mast cell histamine things going on in the brain. I like nine. I really like 321. It's one of those weird frequencies that what does it really do? It reboots. But I, I think it's essential and I'm experimenting with it because sometimes some of the programs we have a minute, two minutes, I'm running it longer. I'm running it for at least four minutes, sometimes longer. I'm experimenting. Yeah. Some of my patients, I'm going longer and longer with 321. I'm really going out on a limb with 321. I um, use it a ton more. All the frequencies that you're talking about, 94, 294, 321, 9. I think they're precursors. I think they need to be used before we, me treating sports injuries a ton. I'm always using 124, but I'm finding the benefit of 124. We talk about it being time dependent. I think all those frequencies that we just listed, if they're run before 124, I don't have to run 124 as long. Yeah. If you think about the histamine, the paralysis, the trauma, all those things happened before a tissue became torn and broken. Yeah, I agree. So it just makes sense. Um, and 124. And what I would say is, this is just like a clinical pearl that I found. What I did was I just, I don't know, I got about 20 brain programs, maybe 25 brain programs that I've designed. So I break them down into the basic condition frequencies, say for the forebrain mm -hmm. and the big and and subacute versus chronic. But when I think of chronic, I think about this a little differently. Some other people think about this because there's so much pathophysiology going on even in chronic. But so I have programs frontal lobe, but then I have one called frontal lobe regeneration where I'm running those frequencies. I'm running 321 longer in that program and I'm running 124 for 45 minutes in that program. And I have one for the hippocampus. I have one that I call hippocampus and stem cell. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing. I'm running that longer and I have people here. Here's a critical thing regarding the brain. That's really interesting and fun. So remember I said, you got to have the fertilizer in the garden. Then you got to acidify the soil for the blueberries. And I will tell you, it's harder to grow blueberries in Idaho than it is in Seattle. Like they grow like weeds in Seattle but around here. It's, you better get that right. So I say, you better get the brain derived nerve growth factor, right? around here in your brain when you're going to do this. But the other essential element is challenge. It's active brain exercise has to be done in conjunction with frequencies, in conjunction with the brain diet that I have, and in conjunction with the brain supplements and even homeopathy. It all has to be done together, but this challenge thing is really important. So let's just say someone comes in there having trouble with memory. You have to challenge their memory to the point, not where they're frustrated, but they, they're challenging it. So I have them all get animal matching card games, these things that you play mm -hmm. with your kids. And okay, where's the giraffe? Okay, and every day they're playing this. And then the other thing I have all of them get is a Simon. You know what the Simon is? This is one of my favorite games growing up, yes. Yeah, and then I ask them, what level are you achieving? And then depending on what the issues are like, 
if, if they can't remember words or let, let, let's just say someone comes in and says, I can't find words. That's in the frontal lobe. If they can't speak words, that's broke as motor speech. So I've got this three-page questionnaire that I will assess every region of the brain with seven to 10 questions for each region. But let, so you got to figure out, okay, what can't they do well? Now I have to design a program to challenge it. Right. If you do not challenge when you're doing the other stuff, they won't make nearly the gains that if you challenge, you have the brain, brain training, brain exercises while you're doing all the other stuff. That's why it's not just FSM for a lot of things in the brain. FSM com combined with low EMF, combined with exercise, because exercise creates BNF, like not BDNF. It's the best way to create BDNF. And then you have the supplements doing certain things. There, there are certain supplements that I use for the brain. And you use a brain-based diet because I'll just give you one piece of information. Believe it or not, parsley is a really good brain food that nobody knows about because it helps M1 cells go to the M2 phase. Who would have thought that? Not me. I love parsley. So Do that's you know great. what flavonoid does that? Apigenin. Oh. Just in case you needed a, a word for the day. Apigenin. I love it. I love, it. I love the word. Apigenin. Um, we have a couple questions coming in that I do want to get at, and we're going to go back to some of the topics that I've listed here for you. Dana writes, she's doing neurofeedback and wanted to benefit from the BDNF enhancement of ketamine. She has a prescription, but the neurofeedback doc said that ketamine increased slow wave activity. Where is that one of the areas I need to reduce? Is the solution here to just take the ketamine after a session rather than during? Any thoughts on that one with ketamine? I don't use a lot of ketamine in my practice. I've used it for chronic pain. Ketamine can be used for um, PTSD as well. I just, I don't use it that much. And my understanding, ketamine is usually dosed every day. So I'm not aware of people modifying when they're taking it because it's usually dosed every day. You're trying to have, you're trying to, usually trying to have it for 24 hours at a time. I'm not going to say that I'm a ketamine expert and can answer that question. I, I figure I'm pretty smart and have taken a lot of deep dives, but I'm not a ketamine expert. I have used it, but I don't know exactly when to, I'm not going to tell someone how to dose ketamine on a podcast. Yeah, no, appreciate that. The next question, <laughs> how dangerous are smart electric meters? They are being installed here. Protection. Very dangerous. Very dangerous. Okay. Very dangerous. Okay. And here's the deal on that. You have to call the electric company, ask them to switch it out with a non-smart a meter. I'll tell you a quick story. I was in my house in Seattle in Redmond. And one day I started getting massive headaches and no energy. I woke up, what the F is wrong with me? Massive headaches, no energy. I'm usually like the energizer buddy. I'm not manic depressive. But somehow, Kim, whenever I talk to you, I like to just talk about so much stuff. You always oh, manic. I'm not manic. I just have a lot of information. But uh, and you know, I'm not manic, right? Yes. Anyway, <laughs> so no energy. I ha I have some of these test meters. I one's called Smart, and I think it's called Smart and Safe too. There's a company in Toronto. I think it's it's Toronto that sells them. Anyway, and anyway, I turned it on and it was like off the charts and do extreme. I go, what? I had already tuned my house up to be low EMF on everything. And remember, EMF has three components, radio frequencies, electromagnetic fields, and electrical. So I always measure radio frequencies, and that comes from a smart meter. And I go, I didn't allow the, the, the electric company. So it turned out my next door neighbor, who literally had a baby, didn't know about this. Even though I sent flyers around to the whole neighborhood, they just all ignored it. Then he gets in touch with me and said, hey, you're a doctor, right? Didn't you send a flyer that I ignored? And I go, apparently you did ignore it. He goes, what are we going to do? I had to literally buy a shield for it to put on the outside of it, and which cut it down by about 60%. And then they called the power company to remove it. They're really harmful. Wow. Okay. Really. That's yeah, if you want to become demented, have a smart meter. It's part of your program. <laughs> They're horrible. And yeah. same thing with a smart house. So uh, this is a new thing. Smart houses are really problematic because I just moved into a new house. I texted you about this, about a house four minutes away on a lake. And like these, there's this thing called Brilliant. And if that thing is connected to Wi-Fi, which we don't have in my house, there's no Wi-Fi, it's all Ethernet. 
So Wi-Fi is not good, or at least turn it off when, when you go to sleep. But but these smart homes make it seem like you should be able to speak to it, tell it to turn the lights down, do this. When you have a system like that, it's massive radio frequency fields you and your family's being exposed to. Smart homes do not lead to smart people. <laughs> I knew that I was hoping something was going to creep up that you were going to say something like that. A um, couple more questions here, and then I'm going to get back to my list. So somebody had asked if somebody responded positively to 9494, which is me, I absolutely love that frequency. I can sniff it out like a drug sniffing dog in a crowd of a thousand people. If somebody's running it, I will go and lay on them. So if somebody responded positively to 9494 on one occasion, can they get dizzy from it in a subsequent session? I have not seen that. Um, yeah, I haven't seen that either. And I, the reason why I said I'm very careful with it is, Okay, let's say you, I do a very comprehensive evaluation initially, and I recommend FSM as part of it if I do. Then if they come in and they get FSM and they get exposed to 9494, and I'm now finding about, I don't know, one in five people, they don't just get dizzy with it. They feel like crap. And they yes. then they rule out FSM as a treatment. I'm like, oh, that's what everything's going to be like here. So, and what I was doing, I was running through test frequencies. Yeah. And I, I could not tell necessarily when I put it on that they were going to respond like this because most of the time it didn't occur immediately. It didn't even occur while they were in the room because I have bells in my, I have bells in my FSM room. They, if they have to go to the bathroom and they feel weird, they ring the bell and nobody was ringing the bell that had these problems, but then I'd see them later on or I'd see them later on the hallway. How do you feel? Oh, not too good. So that's why I don't do it on the first visit. And I and this is what I found that there's certain patients that are probably not going to tolerate it. But if someone really tolerates it or likes it, or at some point, maybe after you've done a few visits, you say, okay, look, I want to try this because I think that we have to work on your brain stem. Or like I, I had this patient recently, she had sleep apnea testing, and part of it was central apnea. You cannot treat central apnea with a CPAP machine. It's weird. You can't. And so I started treating her brain stem. And I just had to make sure that she could deal with 94, 94. And, and, and luckily she could. I don't introduce it until like maybe three sessions in because I see a lot of tough patients like you do, but a lot of mine are mixed musculoskeletal, brain, autoimmune, this and that. I don't want them ruling FSM out as an option because they felt awful after one visit. And I'm amazed how long it can go on for. Some right. of these people a day or two. Yeah. I pretend to understand it. So if anybody says no pain, no gain, or no this, no that, no. FSM can cause side effects, yeah. and I'm very respectful of them. Yeah, we have, we see it a lot. 94, 94 makes people violently said ill, nausea, dizziness, malaise, all of it. So I know a lot of people are contributing that to vestibular injuries. So people who have vestibular injuries will not tolerate 94, 94. A lot of us in sports, a lot of the trainers will just run it anyways. And the guy gets sick and then he gets over it and then he's fine. I do yeah. not have the, the clinic to support that. I'm like you, I will test it first. So if I know somebody needs concussion, I will stay in the room until 94, 94 is on. And if they're going to have a reaction, it's typically going to happen within the first minute. So if after a minute passes and they feel okay, I feel safe enough to leave the room or leave it on. If they feel yucky, I just, I have a concussion protocol that I've taken 94, 94 out. Yeah, so I have that. Yeah. But that's what I run on people. If I'm going to run that, I have one without 94, 94. That's yes. what I run. Yes. Perfect. Okay. I want to talk about the blood brain barrier a little bit more because you're bumper sticker and now I want one. So I feel like we need a little bit more information before we go get bumper Maybe stickers. we should give everybody at the advanced meetings this year, the blood brain barrier bumper sticker, not only with respect to blood brain barrier, but a picture of it. I have absolutely wonderful pictures of the blood brain barrier. You show it to me and I will design a sticker for you. How about that? What frequencies are you, okay. First of all, is there what kind of diagnostic tests are there if you're suspecting the blood brain barrier, talking about blood tests before, and do you use specific frequencies for the blood brain barrier? So there is the test that we talked about before, like Cyrex Labs and Vibrant right. are the two main companies that are doing these. Uh, AROP, A-R-U-P does it. I think, I think LabCorp sends it out there. The problem is it's sometimes a little hard to get it through the standard labs. 
So that was the first question. How do you diagnose them? I, and here's the deal. Anybody with a brain problem, I'm running these tests. I do not want to get 10 weeks in, eight weeks in, and, and then find out they got a blood-brain barrier problem. I want to know soon. But I will tell you this, which is actually fascinating. A lot of functional medicine docs will check for leaky gut or intestinal permeability. Guess what? The same junctional proteins in the intestine are in the brain, in the blood-brain barrier. So, so you could even ask somebody, hey, have you had a leaky gut test? Did it show positive? Then very high probability that at least some basic, like anti zonulin testing is one of them, is going to be positive in the brain. So sometimes that's enough. But but I like the one that has five different tests because I, I want to know how bad it is right from the start. So, so I'll check that. Now, in terms of frequencies... And there's also certain supplements too. But when we, I'm hoping that this particular brain thing that I teach at the advanced meeting, you can actually go to because you've never been to one of mine, Kim. So I would be honored if you were able to go because often you're speaking at the same time. So I think this year you might be able to go. So you'll see a picture of it. And, and, and so part of this is what are you trying to do with this? It's not, it's blood vessels. So here's the deal. You've got to work on capillaries. You've got to work on arteries, but more capillaries. So 162, you've got to work on, the trouble is you've got to work on astrocytes, microglial cells. So in some ways you're working on the immune system. So I, I would use 116 on the B channel. I do, I do work on 162. I really have to, right now I'm on my Mac. I'd have to pull up my PC to look at my blood brain. I got a couple of blood brain barrier programs. I, I should have had it ready to go to just tell you what I'm doing with it. We'll but, have to come to your advanced meeting. Yeah, you will. It's, it is good. I talk, I do talk this fast because no matter how much time I ever have, I don't have enough time to cover all the material, but it's very practical. But anyway, so you do have to use nine because there is immune stuff going on in the brain. There's mast cell stuff going on in the brain, allergy stuff going on. You, you, you got to use nine in relationship to 162. And I actually put 162 and 116 as primary issues because th there aren't any frequencies like microglial cell, specifically frequencies for some of these cells that form the blood brain barrier. But a lot of the stuff that forms it is the vessels. Right. And, yeah. Okay. Talking about supplements, like FSM obviously is a great adjunct, but it's not a one-stop shop. So are there any homeopathic supplements that you like to introduce aside from just prescribing certain things? Yeah. So I love homeopathy, but I, I would change the term from supplements to homeopathic medicines. Okay. So what's interesting is a lot of the Schools of homeopathy, whatever, they've begun very specific. These are homeopathic medicines, but they're not necessarily prescription medicines because you get them from homeopathy companies or homeopathy labs that make them. You can get some homeopathic products um, at Whole Foods and your local health food store, especially those Boron, B-O-I-R-O-N products that a lot of these health food stores have. First of all, there's Arnica, and Arnica should be applied to the neck and the head right on the same day of the injury, but multiple times, and then it should be taken orally in the 6C dose. So the dose is important because the lower the number, like 6, is more acute, mm -hmm. the higher than the number, like 30C, is more chronic stuff. So it's important to get the dose right of the Arnica. The gels are pretty, they're low dose. So I have people do the gels. And one of the key things about homeopathy medicines is you don't want people touching them. You just want them getting them in the cap and dumping them under the tongue, 15 minutes away from water or anything and let them dissolve. And I've been amazed how effective this stuff is. It's, I, sometimes, I think sometimes they're not effective when people don't do it right. But then there's one called Natrum, N-A-T-R-U-M, sulfuricum that's specific for head injuries. Wow. And then there's one called gelsimium that's more specific for headaches related to head injuries. And uh, yeah, but the interesting thing about homeopathy is that most homeopathic medicines have multiple indications. For instance, you might be interested in this. I don't know if I've ever told you this, but I ever talked to you about the homeopathic medicine, Brionia? No. This is going to be your favorite thing. Your new favorite thing. All right. As a matter of fact, if you get a new puppy, you could name it Brionia. <laughs> <laughs> the, 
Brionia is a homeopathic medicine for any kind of musculoskeletal problem that gets worse with motion. Oh. And it works wonders. And the dose, usually the dose is 6C because that's what you can get. But you'd be surprised if people say, oh, I get this problem with this tendon or this and it acts up or this tendonitis around the hip. A lot of bursitis around the hip is not bursitis. It's tendinopathy. And then you give someone Brioni, you say, okay, look, take this before you walk. Take this before you work out. Take this before your event, whatever. They do a lot better. It's like you're speaking to me personally right now because I'm having some hip problems that is being misdiagnosed as bursitis. And I know it's not because when I run torn and broken in the tendon, everything feels better. So yeah. you were right on the money with this um, supplement. Yeah. Okay. So you might, so you brought up something interesting that's not the brain, but I, I don't just deal with the brain in my practice either. It's like a lot of stuff on the lateral hip is tendinopathy. Yeah. It's not bursitis. And the reason the doctors diagnose bursitis is most docs don't know any better. And then they put a steroid injection in there for a tendinopathy, which is really contraindicated. The weird thing is it helps for a little while, but then it just doesn't work anymore. And it degenerates the tendon even more. So, so yeah, you, I, try you... it. Try it for when you work out and text me and let me know if it helps you. I'm going to. And but try it with patients too. I'm going to. And we can get this at a supplement company. The best place to get, you can get it at Whole Foods or right. one of the places. That, uh, my favorite place to get homeopathics is in California to order it from a, a lab called Hanneman Labs. H-A-H- and E M A N N. I really like them. And Hanneman, Dr. Hanneman was like the founder, one of the founders of homeopathy. Interesting. So they named this lab after, but they do a really good job. And like I'm treating a lot of post-COVID syndrome. We should do a we should do another thing on post-COVID syndrome, the integration of FSM. I would love that. With, with supplements and homeopathy, because I am having absolutely amazing results now with homeopathy and post-COVID syndromes. Yeah, that's a whole other podcast and a half to talk about that. I, I do want to go a little bit more back to our topic with post-concussion syndrome a little bit. A lot of the athletes that I tend to see that have post-concussion syndrome, their primary complaint that either they're seeing or their partner is telling me is their mood has dramatically changed. Their yes. personality has changed. Can you talk a little bit about what we're seeing on an emotional sort of level? Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. That's called mood instability. That's one term. There's actually a ICD-10 code for mood instability, okay. um, but it has to be dealt with because it's it could it could lead to marriage issues. The person who got the head injury snapping at their kids that leads to pretty severe irritability, anger, snapping, like a short fuse that's pretty bad. Yeah. So, yeah, and I, I had a patient that yeah, you won't believe this story, but. She had a new stove in a new house and the stove blew up and threw her across the room. I like, holy mackerel, you want to cook an egg and you get blown across the room. So she had a blast injury, but people can get blast injuries other ways. Recently, I had a, a guy that was 22 that was like digging on a property, dug into a gas line and got thrown across the lawn. So these are called blast injuries. But anyway, Virtually any kind of head injury can lead to mood instability, and it can be a big problem. And so and then I think what we're looking at here is there's a lot of, it's very complicated because people can get severely depressed. It gets worse if they don't sleep. So we have to, we got to figure out how to get them sleeping. Sometimes their mind races, you get to get, get that stuff. So sleep is, they have to sleep if they're going to repair their brain. But I've got some limbic system FSM programs that have helped a lot Interesting. to deal with this because like if you ignore it and you're treating everything else you get their memory better you get their speech better you get their the coordination you get their focus of attention and you don't get that better it's they're still they're not good so you have to work on that and then there's some neurotransmitter things that go on with that so that's a multifactorial approach. A lot of it's related to brain inflammation. It's yeah. related to limbic system damage. I will often teach them tapping techniques, emotional freedom technique, yeah. because that will unload some of this because whatever it is, it's, I don't have this problem usually, but I moved recently and there was so much every hour someone was calling me, texting me about this and this. 
And I was developing limbic system dysfunction. I was like, okay, you're going to tap, you're going to get more sleep and not resolve. But when it's a head injury, or you can also have that for other reasons, it has to be dealt with in a very comprehensive fashion. It's called limbic system dysfunction. Interesting. We, yeah, we see a lot of it with post-concussion. And like I said, a lot of these athletes are irritable to begin with because they're not playing. So that is a whole factor unto itself when they're irritated, but when there is that physiological reason of why they're irritated, why like you said, like this, the short fuse tends to be like that hallmark symptom that so many, and I always say sometimes the athletes or the patients won't report that it'll be their partner. that reports Right. It. Cause um, they, well, sometimes they're aware of it and other times they're not aware of it. Yeah. 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 Do you find that running some of the emotional frequencies, FSM, touch it or not really because you're not really treating the root cause of, of it? It's more of that, like you said, that limbic disorder. I think you have to do both. Yeah. I mean, I'll never un underestimate the emotional frequencies, but, but sometimes I, I want to run some of them longer mm -hmm. because I think on the mode bank, there's a motion program. I think it runs each one for two minutes or something. So there's some that are specifically for anger. It's 970 in the liver. So what I try to do is identify, okay, what are the emotions that this person has about this issue? Uh, I do try to run emotional frequencies by the third visit on a lot of people. And if I'm able to tell them, I'll tell them. And if I can't, I won't. But I, it, it doesn't do the trick by itself. You have, I found you have to treat the limbic system and you have to take a multifactorial approach because if this stuff goes on too long, it's more difficult the longer it goes on for. Yes, yes. And the other thing you got to do with the athletes that are sitting out is you got to ask them, what do you say to yourself? Because mm -hmm. a lot of them are starting to say, I'm worthless. I'm no good. I'm not playing. And you've got to reprogram that right away. Yes. Yeah. That's Give them a mental exercise to say, hey, even though I'm not playing, I'm still very valuable and I'm going to be playing. Yes. 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 Yeah. The Positive affirmations are huge. Dr. Roger Bilico was talking about that at his last talk last yeah. year. It was huge. A couple more questions that are coming in live. I so we talked a little bit more about chronic conditions. I want to talk a little bit about acute concussions, the benefit in seeing somebody like yourself right after they get injured versus somebody who's waited a while. Any anything you want to say about that? About yeah. So one of the things that drives me crazy is like people say, okay, it's been three months and you're not getting better. And part of the thing I'm trying to do with, I developed a program to heal the brain. It's written up in a neurology textbook called Integrative Neurology. But I still, I'm still not informing enough people that do concussions. I'd, ra I'd rather have everybody trained that's handling concussions in this. Then we wouldn't have so much agony about this and so many people that aren't doing well. Because the, the golden period, I would say, is the first eight weeks. And that's when you really need to get a lot of interventions going here so that you don't lose too many neurons and you don't lose too many synapses and you don't end up with so many, so much inflammation and so many, and then the limbic instability and all this, because you can have a lot of vicious cycles. And so this whole thought of, we're going to give this eight weeks and you're just going to rest and not do much. And then if you're not doing well, then we'll send you to a speech therapist. Or we're, no, people need care right away. But the problem is they need this type of care that I'm talking about that integrates the way you're eating getting the right sleep, the right kind of FSM, not just the concussion program. You got to design programs that deal with the different brain regions and get creative with it. And I would encourage anybody who does FSM, start writing some of your own programs, just experiment with it and get on the right supplements and get it started ASAP as soon as possible. Because if you think you're doing good by going to the neurologist, you're not, they don't know this stuff. There's only a few neurologists that know this that are probably like that I've spoken to or have heard me talk. Most of them don't. We have a patient, actually, this could go really well. I want to transition a little bit. I know we only have a few minutes left into the neck because it's impossible, in my opinion, to treat the brain without at least acknowledging it's attached to the neck. Um, but we have a patient who's also a practitioner that's on here and he's having neck surgery tomorrow. Um, so he is, I'm just going to pull this up really quickly. He is having a laminoplasty C3 through C7 and ACDF C5 through 37. Wow. Do you have any great protocols? We do have a post-op C-spine protocol week one to four on the mode bank, but is there anything that you, 
would add or you want to comment on with a surgery like that that he should focus on? Yeah, he should set up a consultation with me for half an hour because this is not simple. But because that's like okay, tomorrow. What, what do you do? What do you do with somebody who's having because he's having a fusion? It sounds like a, a three-level fusion is what I'm getting out of this and a laminoplasty. So what I usually do is have people start taking arnica after the surgery and not applying it to where the stitches are in other areas around the neck. And so the protocol for arnica gel is every half an hour, every 20 minutes to half an hour, just don't get it near where the sutures are. And arnica 6C, so you'll decrease the amount of bruising and bleeding that way. And I, I would do it like four times after you wake up and then a couple more times and then four times a day for two or three more days. Um, I would use nature himself. I, I would probably use nature himself Puricum because that it's almost like in general, th there's this whole issue. So I'd run the program to clear anesthesia. I would run a program to clear anesthesia because they're, you're under general anesthesia for a while. And that's, that can be toxic to the brain. So I'd run a program to clear anesthesia. I'd probably put them on some phase two detox support through the liver to clear some of that anesthesia. And then I probably take nature himself, Ferricum 30 C three times a day for two to three times a day, maybe for five days. Cause it's almost like the anesthesia is like a not brain damage. Don't get me wrong, but a little bit of a head injury. For sure. No, those are important. Thank you for talking about that. A couple more questions and then we'll do a little wrap up here. Lynn asked, I have a TBI PTSD patient who hears voices constantly since the dog attack and tumble down a concrete staircase. The most relief, here's my alarm saying that it's time to end the podcast. Sorry. The most relief he has had is from a protocol I designed to treat trauma, inflammation and rebuild the frontal lobe. The voices have not stopped, but they can be ignored for a time. The question is, what might you suggest? The protocol has the trauma frequencies 40, 284, 3, 124, and 49 on 90. Yeah, but then when you're talking about hearing voices, you're talking about, it's almost like, that gets very tricky. <laughs> this gets into the psychiatry realm. It gets into paranoia. It's... Uh, it's almost like an auditory, it's like an auditory hallucination. Um, so I would run the PTSD program for sure. Absolutely. Multiple times. There's all these supplements I would put that person on to stabilize the brain. The problem is I don't want to give a prescription right now for supplements for someone starts to do it. That's almost, it's not like a prescription for medications, but there's certain supplements that might decrease brain inflammation stabilize the brain. Low dose lithium is very good in some respects. It's not like high dose lithium, but this is getting very tricky with that type of symptom. But I would treat not only 90, I'd also treat 89. Yes. Speaking of 89, so we're, we 4089 has been mine and Carol's kind of new favorite pairing. I, I treat that before I can do any more of the reboot or motor patterning improvement because the patient has to feel safe with the movement first. So the other big frequency that we talk a lot about is the vagus nerve. So somebody had asked here about treating the limbic system, but can turning the vagus on or turning the vagus back on help? Does using vagus ever cause nausea and dizziness? Okay, so I don't use the word turning the vagus on. Let me explain this quick because this is one of my pet peeves. The vagus is never completely off. It's got a, it's a balance in the nervous system. So the vagus is functioning to some degree. It's, it's, I like to call it dysfunctional because you can have retrograde transmission of, of different bacterial particles and viruses in the vagus. And so that brings up a whole nother ball game about the vagus. Design your own vagus program that also has virus frequencies in it, that has some bacterial uh, toxin frequencies in it, if you're not getting the results you want with the vagus program. But I do think that a lot of people that have had neck injuries head injuries, have had vagus nerve traction injuries potentially, so that I, I do think it makes sense to treat it. Now, that's not turning it on. It's making it more functional. And I haven't had people get nauseated, but I've got a number of different vagus. I, 
I even got mold frequencies in my Vegas program. And so I have virus, bacterial toxin frequencies, mold free, and depending, I always start with the basics. So I do think if someone gets, you know, not with uh, Vegas, regular Vegas program, you're just going to be creative and modify a program for them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a couple more questions here about the smart meters really quick before we wrap up. Somebody was asking about using a shield. Dr. Allen here said, KPUD won't let us install shielding. Do protective devices like EMF SOL that supposedly normalize intracellular calcium really work? No, they don't work that well. So okay. what I would say is you can install a shield, which almost looks like a metal circular cylinder that you put over it. And there's a number of companies called Smart Shield, or you just look it up like Smart Meter Shield. You find these companies, you can just put it right over it. That does cut it down by about 60 to 70%. The ideal thing is to ask the, the, the electrical company to take it off and just put the kind of meter that needs to be read. That means you're going to pay extra. You're going to pay maybe an extra 10 bucks a month, 15 bucks a month to have the meter read. That's what I used to do on like, Around here, we haven't had smart meters. So I just moved into a new house. I better find out if I have a smart meter. But no, you can put a, a shield on it. These things that you turn on, there is a company that I do use that generates a scalar field that I think is very helpful if you can't reduce fields or even if you have some fields that you don't like in your home. And the product is called Rest Shield, R-E-S-T, Shield. The company is called Fresh and Alive. And that technology, I think, really works. There's so much stuff out there that I don't think really works. But this one, I really think works. Interesting. Okay. Do you have any last little nuggets that you let you that are just dying to get off your chest that you need to share with us about anything? Or I don't know. If someone wants to reach me for a consultation, then there's different ways to do it. One is the I'm going to give you my clinic email. Okay. Um, Dr. Musnick, D-R-M-U-S-N-I-C-K at funmedidaho, F-U-N-M-E-D-Idaho.com. That's my email if you want to set, set something up. Because if the patient is not in Idaho or Washington, that's where I have my medical license, then I can do what's called a peer-to-peer. -peer. And just by the way, do you know how good your patient's doing that you sent to me? I would love to hear about it. Did you? Oh my God, the guy was like, he had severe Parkinson's. He's walking better. He feels better. His wife says he's doing a lot better. That's after one consultation. We had the return visit, but he's doing so much better. So anyway, I can do like a peer-to-peer, -peer, whereas if you're a practitioner and you got a patient, then basically I take the history with you and the patient and then give you know, advice in regard to homeopathy, supplements, diet, whatever they need but i can't just randomly answer sometimes people will email me they probably do it with you hey can you help me with it i don't have time to do it so yeah. if you email me and just ask me for help you're going to have to pay for my time even if it's 50 minutes i literally don't have time yes. to randomly solve a case by email i just i can't do it no and but I i'm happy to help people and in terms of other things the other th clinical pearl i would say is take care of your brain First of all, lower your electromagnetic fields. Find out if anybody does EMF assessment. Do that at basic or just turn your Wi-Fi off at night. At least do that. And get if you got Ethernet ports, have it put into Ethernet ports. So you pull it out of the Ethernet ports and you're not exposed to Wi-Fi all the time. Right. And then at least start with that. There's so many other things that, that you could be doing. And if you have kids that have any brain problems, get them some curcumin gummies which are these mango tasting, we didn't talk about this, but there's a type of curcumin that passes the blood brain barrier called long vita curcumin. And Nordic Naturals put it into a mango flavored gummy that is so tasty that I've only had one kid. I've had a lot of kids in my practice since I moved to Idaho with brain issues, concussion, whatever. And only one kid said, mom, I don't like mango. Every other kid, I want the gummies. And the parents had to control how many they were eating. You could have those for a stack for your kids. And that helps keep the brain healthy because it de curcumin decreases brain inflammation. Delicious. One more time with your email address. So D-R-M-U-S-N-I-C-K at fun, F-U-N, 
med, M E D, Idaho. Dot com. Thank you. And then and if someone if someone wanted to, I think that's the best way to get a hold of me. I mean, they 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 could we could set up a time to talk. We could I say, hey, what do you think about this case? Could you help me with it? I'll respond to it and say, yeah, I think we can. And then we could set up a time to talk very briefly, but then we're gonna have to set up a time on my clinic schedule. Yes. We appreciate your time so much. Thank you for coming. I know this was a bit of a journey getting you here, but we appreciate your knowledge so much. I'm so excited to finally see your talk at the advanced. For those of you listening and who have not signed up for the advanced meetings in March, please do. They go pretty fast. The um, sports course that I teach is halfway, a little bit more, 75% sold out already. So please sign up for that. You can email me at kim at fsmsports365.com or info at fsmsports365.com to um, sign up for the courses that way. Yeah, you're teaching two of them, right? Yes. Are you doing an advanced and a basic? Yes. So there's a new FSM sports advanced course. So I'm going to the advanced. Yes. Sure. All and, right. Um, don't cut the advanced meeting is so much fun and you learn so much. My only problem this year is we won't have True Land Burgers to go to. We're going to have to find another place. I know the chop shop is my like second <laughs> favorite. They have great bowls. So we'll have to do a lunch or a dinner there for sure. Chop shop. Yes. Okay. Hey, thanks everybody for coming. I will be back here. Same time, same place next week. I'll be by myself or I'll be with the guest. I have something very special planned. And then the week after that, Dr. McMakin is back from her word travels and we'll regroup and debrief. Dr. Musnick, thank you once again. Thanks everybody for coming. We'll see you all next week. Bye. Thank you. Bye. The Frequency Specific Microcurrent Podcast has been produced by Frequency Specific Seminars for entertainment, educational, and information purposes only. The information and opinions provided in the podcast are not medical advice, do not create any type of doctor-patient relationship, and unless expressly stated, do not reflect the opinions of its affiliates, subsidiaries, or sponsors, or the hosts, or any of the podcast guests or affiliated professional organizations. No person should act or refrain from acting on the basis of the content provided in any podcast without first seeking appropriate medical advice and counseling. No information provided in any podcast should be used as a substitute for personalized medical advice and counseling. FSS expressly disclaims any and all liability relating to any actions taken or not taken based on or any contents of this podcast.